the BOS framework. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. So uh, I learned about these codes actually last, last time on this meeting in 2007, and I sort of was suddenly fascinated by them, and I thought this is something that I should be able to think about because graphs I like, and there are sort of ge geometrical properties to them that are sort of very natural, and I, I just like them. And so, and so, you know, one thing we did was try to come up with a way to error correct these codes, and basically we failed. So there are typically non-additive codes, and I'll tell a little bit more about them. But you know, if you try to error correct them, the uh, you know it's exponential complexity. Even in the classical case, you can come up with tricks that are actually seem to be working and give you exponential speed up of this exponentially slow process, but still not fast enough. So you still get exponential complexity to decode the general CWS codes. And then, and so the, the work that I'm going to be talking about is trying to come up with actually stabilizer codes just by using this uh, framework. And so I'll start by, yeah, and so I'll, I'll start, start with a little introduction talking about these codes in general and then sort of give you uh, our results. So, well, this is sort of the slide that shouldn't probably be here on this conference. And basically, I just want you to, re uh, want you to, want to remind you about the stabilizer states. So, in, a Pauli, in an n qubit Pauli group, if you have n commuting operators that don't include minor, you know, a group that includes n commuting operator generators don't include minus one, there is a, you know, they will always stabilize a unique stabilizer. And so you can come up with it if you have some, some, some stabilizer code, but you can come up to you know, such states in a different way. And so the quintessential example, of course, is the 513 stabilizer code. And I will be talking about such codes, you know, about this particular code a couple times today you know, in a couple examples. And so what you should remember is that uh, the, <coughs> well, it's, it's the smallest code ever. You know, there is a five qubit code, distance three, and it encodes one qubit. And so one, one of our results, we came up with a torus. We came up with a way to map these two surface codes. And, you know, this is sort of in the way to entice you. So, so, you know, what's the graph states? The graph states is yet another way to encode the stabilizer states. Or you can think of this as just a standard form of a state. And so a graph state is generated by these operators. So you have one x operator and then a bunch of z's that are to the power of the symmetrix makes matrix g gamma that forms adjacency matrix of a graph. And so, for example, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the diagonal. And so, <coughs> important for this talk will be the notion of a distance of a graph state. And this is the minimum weight of an element of the graph stabilizer. And so now, for this case, the, you know, the simp one of the simplest graph states is this three qubit graph. This is just a ring. And so the generators are x and then neighboring zz and then x, z, z, and then x, z, z. So there are a total of three generators. And so the graph state is actually a entangled state, which is an equal superposition of all of two to three states with some phases. Now, the code was stabilized codes when invented you know, in 2007. The paper came out in a you know, couple years later. So you know, there were lots of reference for the actual, there were lots of references to the preprint instead of the actual papers. And so basically, the, these codes are specified by a graph, which gives you the graph state, and the classical code. And the classical code can be additive or non-additive. Basically, you start with the graph state, and you generate the basis vectors of the code by this code word operators, which are just products of Zs to you know, raised to the power of each code word. And so, and so the beautiful thing about these codes is that any error can be mapped to a binary vector. And so the mapping is you just take an error, which is a product of x's and z's, and you multiply it by 
graph state stabilizers which have the corresponding x to it. And so this adds this additional z's, but at the end you only have error that is only z operator. And so we have a classical code. The code words are specified in terms of this classical vectors, and we also have the classical errors, and so this is the map. This basically gives you sort of an idea of why these codes are sort of simplified. So you have, and so one sort of canonical example, this is, is the 562 code. This is non-additive code, so it is generated from the five ring, you know, with these generators, and then you just add the six classical code words, and so you have this six-dimensional code space, which is more than one qubit, but, or I guess more than two qubits, but less than three qubits, so this is somewhere in between. Okay, and then, now the problem is, again, as, to repeat myself, is that there are no known efficient algorithms to decode non-additive CWS codes, and so what we're, what we're doing, we're trying to find additive codes which are equivalent to the stabilizer codes. So this framework inf includes all of the stabilizer codes. And so the, before I go on, I have to explain sort of the error correction or error detection condition for these codes. And so basically, you know, the general error detection condition that if you have an error and if you have vectors, you know, if you have vectors that form the codes, the code, the code space, the span of these vectors is the code. The uh, sort of this, this product, this matrix elements should be constant, which depends on the error itself times the Kronecker delta with respect to the code. And basically this current code is either left untouched or it is moved to the orthogonal space and this is what we're after. This is you know, why we can correct the errors. And so for the CWS codes, there are actually two cases. One case is the non-degenerate case where the error takes you basically to zero. This matrix element is zero, the constant C is zero. And then it, for these errors, you can just use the classical code and you can just collect them, correct them classically. So the stabilizer that you would measure would be a classical binary stabilizer. And then, <coughs> and then you can sort of do it very easily. And then the second case is degenerate, where this error is not zero. And of course, in the class, this corresponds to the classical map of the error being exactly zero. And so in the quantum case, if you are trying to construct a code, this error must actually commute with every W over. And that means that this binary scalar products of the binary code vectors and the vector v that determines the error should be zero. And so there are sort of simple bounds that you can come up with for CWS codes. Well, first of all, if you talk about the error that only involves, that only involve, involves, um, only involves z operators, you know, this is just a classical error. And so this error should be corrected by the classical code. So the graph stabilizer elements are not involved in using that error. And so basically there is a simple bound that the quantum code that you get out of a classical code, the distance is always less or equal that to the classical code. Now, if you have a non-degenerate CWS code, then you can also show that its distance does not in, does not need the distance of the graph state that I defined earlier. This is the minimum weight of the stabilizer. However, in the case of degenerate CTS codes, the situation becomes interesting. And so basically you can show that if, the, if there is a bit that is involved in the classical code, and that means one of the code vectors is non-zero on that bit, then the distance of the, this code cannot exceed the weight of the corresponding, the weight of the corresponding stabilizer. And, okay, and so, and so if you combine these two, then you sort of understand that if you have a graph with vertices of a given degree r, then the distance of a code does not exceed r plus one. And so in order to you know, these are all vertices of the same degree. And so if you are looking at 
codes that are generated by some nice lattices, like for example, lattice. You would, you know, for a squared lattice, there are five, there are four neighbors, so the weight of this S operator is five, and so the distance of a CWS code that you can get out of squared lattice can never exceed, can never exceed five, and so. Uh, then typically, if, if you want to find codes of large distance, then you would be looking at sort of very uh, graphs with lots and lots of legs. And then also that if, <coughs> yeah, th this is sort of, it cannot be bigger, the distance cannot be bigger than the minimum weight of the stabilizer. And so I'll just give you sort of a few examples to give you a feeling on these codes. So the 513 code is generated by this graph, you know, and then the, the only code word is, just one, 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 so the classical code is the repetition code, and the graph stabilizer generator are these, and then, of course, you can, you know, uh, this is repetition code, so the corresponding stabilizer generators are these commute with the uh, binary code. And then, now, <coughs> there are two 613 codes. One, you just add an empty qubit to the 513 code, and that corresponding graph is, has one disconnected vertex and sort of that qubit basically is not used in the code. But the second 613 code is generated by this binary code and, and this graph. And so this, is code, this code is degenerate. So if you take the product of these two stabilizer generators, yeah, I believe they share all of their, all of their neighbors and so the product has, you know, just weight, this is just weight two operator. And so the code is degenerate above this graph distance uh, two, but the just actual distance of the code is three. And then this Steen 713 code uh, is generated by this code word and this graph. And so <coughs> in, it is interesting that whereas the code actually has cyclic symmetry, you know, it's, you know, if you shift this, the stabilizer generators cyclically, it obeys this, you know, th those would also, also be members of the stabilizer group. S nevertheless, there is, uh, there is no explicit graph that obeys this symmetry and there is no uh, binary code that is also symmetric with respect to, with respect to translations. And so now we are looking for additive codes and so I'll just sort of review a little bit this GF4 maps of the stabilizer codes. And the basic picture is that you have an error, which is z to some power, x to some power, and then you map it you have to a bi couple binary vectors and further to GF4 vector, which has, this, uh, which has this omega, and then the two operators commute if and only if the, um, this trace product of the corresponding vectors is is zero, and this is really a symplectic product. And so one of the result is that if you are constructing a C additive CWS code from a stabilizer code and some graph, there is a very simple expression for the corresponding generator matrix of this additive CWS code. And remember, generator matrix, you know, the rows of the generator matrix corresponds to the generators of the, of the stabilizer of the code. So you have a parity check matrix, and then you have graph adjacency matrix. And it is very easy to check, you know, that the graph adjacency matrix is symmetric, so this is a simple graph. Then it's very easy to check that corresponding trace product is actually zero because you know, it, it, it just because of the structure of this. So this is a, so sort of the beauty of this decomposition is that you have a decomposition that is automatically orthogonal. And so, you know, one of the biggest problem in searching quantum codes is ensuring the orthogonality condition. And so one thing we came up with, so suppose you have a graph and it has big enough distance so that you can try to come up with code. And so, so how likely it is that you can, you, you can get a good quantum code out of it. And so basically, it turns out that for all of the co codes that you can generate out of a given graph, you can prove a gilbert warshamov bound, you can come up with a counting argument that the codes that can be generated from a given graph just satisfy this quantum gilbert warshamov bound. And of course, you know, so this means that you can come up with codes, you can always come up with codes that are better than this, assuming that the upper limit on the distance is satisfied. 
And sort of what's nice about it is, of course, in, in some sense, sense, it is a simpler code than any stabilizer code. And so you can always come up with a graph state with the, which is, has distance bigger than this. And, and therefore, as a result, this is sort of the divide and conquer strategy for finding, for finding stabilizer codes. You first come up with a graph with a suitable distance, and then you try to come up with a code which has sort of built in on the graph structure. And well, let me sort of, you know, so this is the classical, Gilbert, so this is code rate, this is distance rate, and this is sort of classical gilbert warshamov bound, this is quantum gilbert warshamov bound, and this is quantum gilbert warshamov bounds for CSS codes. But anyway, so what's the point of is, is trying to find codes which have, you know, good properties, namely finite relative distance and finite rate. And so now, uh, now uh, of course, uh -huh, easiest way to come up with codes is sort of start with a simple graph and that codes which you can generate for on a lattice. And so on a finite square lattice, and this is five by five example, you can actually very easily come up with the code. And so the maximum distance of the code that involves all of the qubit is four because of the edges. And so you can actually very easily come up with simple families that uh, satisfy this. So, so this shows the cartoon of code 2544, so you know, so this is, so these three red circles represent one of the classical, so each vertex is a qubit, and the three, four red circles represent the classical, uh, the classical code, so this is the generator of the classical code, and then you shift it up, shift it left, shift it right, and you know, and you can prove that the weight of any linear combinations is smaller than four just because you always have top, bottom, left, right edges. And so you can do it on any size lattice is an infinite family of codes. And then if you try to find numerical codes, then of course you can do better than that. But those codes still are relatively simple. And this construct also generalizes to an infinite lattice. Now, we looked at cyclic codes, and of course cyclic codes you generate from the cyclic circulant matrix, and the basic idea is that the generators of a stabilizer can be sort of changed cyclically. You take the very, the nth operator and move it to the first place, and then it still be a member of the stabilizer group. And so the standard map for cyclic codes, you go from circulant matrix to polynomial, and then sort of these polynomials are invariant on the shifts, sort of, <coughs> sort of you can, you, you know, for classical codes, this, for classical cyclic codes, this polynomial has to be under, oh, not, not really invariant. Sort of, uh, sort of the shift correspond to this multiplication by the x. And so for an additive CWS code, you have this matrix, and if you both P and R are circulant matrices, that you can write both of them as polynomials. And then the symmetry of this poly circulant matrix correspond to this condition on the polynomial. And so again, this guarantees the orthogonality, and of course, 513 code, the polynomial P is one plus X. This is the parity check polynomial of the, uh, of the repetition code. And then the, the R of X is X plus X to the four. This is symmetric with respect to this condition. Now, you can think about g more general uh, cyclic codes and in the paper on GF codes over GF4, you know, there is a statement that generators have two generators. So this is a degenerate case. It turns out that there are one generator cyclic codes which has to satisfy this condition. And they are given just by the same equation, just by a little bit less restrictive condition on R. So you have to multiply it by P. And so this class turned out to be very broad. And so there are lots of good codes inside of it. And so what you can come up with is lower Gilbert Varshamov bound again for cyclic quantum codes because there are not so many binary, not so many binary codes to look for, for binary cyclic codes. It's easier to actually start with the binary code and then look for a polynomial. And so we can only prove it for irreducible polynomials and then two versions of it depending on whether or not the polynomial is symmetric or, or not. And so then you can do existence proofs 
And so there are lots of codes that you can get out of the repetition code or generalized repetition to have this property. And these quantum codes satisfy exactly the same bound. And then f there are lots of codes that correspond to binary BCH codes. And so these codes actually, you know, provable they either saturate or, you know, possibly, you know, what we proved is that they have parameters that are better than the than any than any codes that are known so far, or well, same or better. And then, sort of the last example is a cyclic toric-like code. I promised you to show why 513 code is is a, is a torus. And so, basically, if you enumerate qubits like this, one, two, three, four, five, and so this is qubit one, this is two, three, four, five, then you can map this qubit on a plane, and so this will take me to my conclusions. And so there are families of such codes and we have a poster talking about them. And so uh, these are conclusions. Okay. Time for one question, two questions. So in the last slide, you showed at the, at the bottom this very wide class of codes with many different distances. And I was wondering if you could comment on. This codes? Uh, yes. Yeah. On, on some of the trade offs that come into play when you start looking at these larger distance codes. Well, OK. So, uh, one trade off for sure is if you are looking for codes that don't have small rate but have a finite rate, even binary codes get the penalty. So, you cannot have, uh, in, in, uh, sorry, finite rate but small weight of the stabilizer, right? These are codes that are easy to measure. You know, toric code is example, of course, and, and, and stuff. So, uh, so one trade-off is that by having bigger rate codes, it turns out you have to weight stabilizer generators. There is no way out. We don't have the bound on that, but, but this is something that definitely plays out in the binary code, and then, you know, with that, you know, by this decomposition, you can also show that this, will, you know, has to be true also for the quantum codes, although it's sort of is probably even slightly worse. So any finite rate code which, you know, k over n, d over n, you know, remains finite, will have, definitely have stabilizers of upper generators of weight bigger than four. So this is one of the traits. These, these are actually c are quite big uh, stabilizer weight. Good. Let's thank our speaker one more time.